On this week's show, I was delighted to be joined by Kevin Haig, Managing Director of Ground Engineering Business, Arslef. Now, in this week's show, Kevin talks about his humble beginnings in the village of Slaley, where he's building fences, all the way through to how he progressed his career through the ground engineering route, worked for some of the biggest contractors in the UK, into his current role, where he's Managing Director of Arslef. Now, Kevin's humble, he's driven, he's got great clarity on his vision, he's a strong leader, and this is for any directors who have encountered challenges over the last few years, but also any young people who are actually thinking, yeah, I really want a, a career in engineering, and, and why it's a great, um, a great career route for, uh, for young individuals in the UK. So listen, um, it's raw, it's real, um, Kevin's down to earth, and I hope you enjoy the show. Thanks. An, an intro, but I've probably not quite done it justice. So um, for the listeners, do you want to um, tell us who you are and what you do? Yeah, thanks, Peter. Well, first of all, nice to be a guest instead of a host. So uh, <laughs> tables have turned for this one. Um, yeah. So Kevin Haig, I'm the managing director of uh, a specialist grand engineering contractor called Arsenal Grand Engineering, uh, based in uh, in the UK. Part of a wider group, uh, Danish Danish contractor. Uh, we have companies in Denmark, Germany, Sweden, Poland, Norway, uh, UK. So yeah, part of a, a large organisation, um, but quite special in the UK at the moment. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a it's a nice it's a nice market to be operating in right now. Yeah, yeah. So 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 how did you uh, how did you kind of get into the ground engineering specialism, Kevin? Uh, right. Okay. So, <clears throat> graduated from Leeds University uh, back in 2000. Um, didn't have much of an idea what I wanted to do uh, once I graduated. Uh, so I went to work for my neighbour, uh, yeah. and he worked at, for the Forestry Commission. And I was building a fence, um, a rabbit fence of all fences, in Slaley, uh, at yeah. Slaley Hall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I've seen an advert in the back of uh, the, is it the Evening Chronicle? The Chronicle? Yeah, yeah the Chronicle. Probably. Yeah, and it said engineer required, and I'd done a degree in, in engineering, so I applied, and it turned out to be a, a almost a geotechnical uh, engineering role, uh, contracts engineer um, for a, a, another uh, co company, a competitor of ours right now, actually, uh, <laughs> and, I, and I got the job. Um, I stayed there for many, many years uh, and worked my way up through the ranks um, and uh, left after eight years. So yeah, that was my, uh, that was my introduction into, into ground engineering. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 20, 20 years ago to the month. Yeah. And, and, and kind of what, you know, obviously first impressions going into that kind of environment. Um, yeah. We were always kind of quite practical as a, as a as individual when you were young. Is that kind of why you went into that? Yeah. I always liked Lego building things, <laughs> taking things apart. Still love Lego. My, my three year, my four year old son, sorry, he's only four. Uh, loves yeah. Lego. Uh, he likes taking things apart, but he's not very good at putting them back together. Uh, but yeah, that, that, I've always been more practical. Um, and yeah, it, it felt it felt quite na a natural fit for me because I'd done a, a degree in uh, mining engineering, actually. Uh, yeah. And uh, the specialist area that I moved into um, in, in my career was uh, not taking minerals out of the ground, but actually putting the material back in to replace uh, the legacies that's been left by our ancestors uh, in the yeah. ground. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. And and and, and that, that that first. So, who was the first business that you you said you were there for eight years? Who was? What was that business? Uh, that business was Vanell. Vanell. Um, yeah. yeah, and specifically well. Vanell Northern, uh, working from their their northeast office in Springwell, which is no longer there. Yeah. They've moved somewhere else in the northeast. Yeah. Yeah. So, so obviously, career started with Vanell. I'm assuming you started as, as an engineer and then worked you worked your way up. So, do you want to tell us kind of mm -hmm. how how you progressed through the business there? Yeah, this there's a, there's two stories here. Um, I'll I'll talk about the the career progression. I'll talk to, I'll talk about the project progression and yeah. the technique progression at the same time. So, yeah, um, someone obviously spotted something in me. Uh, I'll, I'll give credit to that man. This guy called Trevor Collin. Um, who was my managing director at Vanell. Um, he took me under his wing, taught me, guided me, um, became a, an area manager for Vanell after I think two or three years, I can't remember exactly. Um, 
then moved up into um, a director role for Van El. I think I was 26 or 27 at the time. Mm. Um, uh, and left the, the business as their, as their estimating director. I moved away from operations at the end uh, to focus on work winning, just as the credit crunch was starting to, uh, to bite. Yeah. Did you enjoy the work winning function? Yeah, yeah, I do. I, I, like, I like engaging with people. I like trying to find a solution, uh, talking with customers to, to find the most practical solution and the most economic solution. Yeah. Because, I, I mean, I, I suppose with what you guys do, it, it very much is value engineering. I, I would, I would imagine, yeah. Well, uh, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's very much price-driven. Um, right, okay. And, and sometimes value added within the solution is forgotten about, and it's very mm. much the bottom number. Mm. Um, that's, that's my job to try and guide a client uh, uh, to avoiding that mistake. Yeah. Just yeah. going with the bottom price. Mm. So, so you had, yeah, so you had two kind of, I mean, it's quite, to be fair, tw you know, 26 is, is, is mm. young to be getting up to that, that kind of director level. Um, mm. So, yeah. How, how would you, yeah, if I think back through my career, yeah, I certainly wasn't ready at, at, at that kind of age. Did you just have that fire in your belly or, or what, what was the kind of? Uh, well, yeah, I've always been motivated, um, but for, <clears throat> I'd say for the first part of my career, uh, I kind of woke up. Um, when I was a kid, I was always sports-led. Uh, I wasn't really academic-led. I was always sports-led. I loved playing football. Um, but as soon as I moved into the commercial world, um, started focusing on my career, I kind of woke up. And I realized that I could, I could never be satisfied. Um, I'd li I like the idea of always trying to do better. And, and I hate the idea of losing. Um, as well and I think if you put them two things together uh, in your 20s it's quite a potent thing to have it's quite it a is. potent attitude yeah. to have um, I've always hated losing work um, I've always loved working with people and working within teams uh, with a winning mentality so uh, I kind of transported that into in, into my career and subconsciously it just happened I didn't I didn't necessarily think that way I just behaved that way overnight it, it just mm. clicked um, um, so yeah, um, but then as my career moved on, um, I, I've always worked. I always worked uh, at Van Allen in the uh, in the smaller projects um, and uh, smaller holes that we drilled into the ground. And then I moved uh, when when credit crunch hit and, and the recession bit. Um, I left Van Allen and I moved to London. Um, and I worked, started work for a major construction uh, company in London. Worked for their filing uh, arm mm. and in their ground engineering team. Um, and I moved up a level in terms of projects. I went from projects ranging from 50,000 up to 250,000 to 3 million up to the biggest one I delivered was 27-ish million in, in London, um, working for cementation. And I also diversified my skill set. I went away from the smaller drilling into the major piling, uh, the heavy duty rotary board piling, CFA, uh, and diaphragm walling, which is uh, you know quite a heavy technique as well. Um, and that exposed me to a, a very different risk profile in project management, but also leadership, leading bigger teams, leading commercial teams, where the numbers were 250,000, the numbers were millions. Um, and and that's, that was a, a new era for me. Um, but what I've always done throughout Van El and what, what, what Van El taught me, and, and, and credit to, to Trevor Collin, and also Mike Ellis, uh, who sadly passed away at the weekend, uh, they always taught, Vanel employees to look after the pennies and manage the costs. Mm. Uh, and I've always carried that with me uh, ever since my first meeting with Trevor and Mike all the way through my career. Um, you've got to manage the, the detail, manage the costs, not let it get away from you. And I, and I took that approach into the major project uh, delivery as well from, from the smaller business. And that worked well. It worked quite nicely. Yeah, I think, I think that's interesting you say that, um, Gus. I think you... Yeah, if you've got that very, it's quite, it sounds quite simple, mm. but but a lot of people don't do it. And I think, because I, I imagine, you know, you were still fairly young um, and at that age going from, you know, up to managing multi-million pound schemes. Mm. It, it must have been a little bit like, a little bit daunting to a certain degree, but you sound quite headstrong in terms of you had your, you had your ethos, you went in there, this is what, this is, this is how I've been taught, this is how, it needs mm. to be done. Is, is, mm. that, is that how you kind of approached it? 
Yeah, I, th I think it takes one or two projects before you start to, to switch because the, <clears throat> the the numbers can be quite daunting and, and, and the program lengths can be quite daunting and, and, and the technicalities of the job can be quite daunting the first time round. But mm. what you've got to do is, is take it down to its basic component parts. A major project is two or three smaller projects put together. Mm. Same with the cost basis. It's all very much component parts of the process and if you can break it down and make it into bite-sized chunks it, it'll work for you when you get overwhelmed is when you look at it as a global view and you have no ability to break it down mm. that's when things start falling apart so yeah it's just about core principles that was, wasn't necessarily drilled into us but it was it was uh it was very much a value that that we were uh we were taught from a very young age um in our careers and, and i'm saying ours because there are a couple of us in, in the industry who uh who benefit from that training actually yeah yeah so so obviously you you you, know, you, you, you move to cementation you you know bigger contracts um and and, and then f from there you know do you want to tell us how you kind of career progressed onto the next level from there yeah so cementation uh, i finished my career at cementation in 2013 so i stayed there for five years Mm. Um, had a great time in cementation, really broadened my horizons, met a lot of great people, made some long lasting relationships there as well. Um, mm. So I, I look back with uh, fond memories of cementation and I was, um, I was headhunted to go and work for um, a competitor of cementation, a big uh, multinational German rig manufacturer and, and foundation specialist uh, called Bauer. Mm. Um, and at that point in time, I was very much focused on, um, on the technique. I love the idea of large machinery, large complicated projects, but I didn't last very long there. My career was only short there because Arsliff um, presented me a, a, an opportunity, which funnily enough, I originally turned down. Um, but, and I turned it down because I, I was looking at it the wrong way. And I look back and, and I realized what, what I was doing. Um, I'd got, really into big piles, large diameter, uh, complicated jobs. Um, and I was looking at it very much as a project uh, yeah. focus for my career. What I was starting to um, realize is Arsliff, when they came to, to me, um, were offering me a business opportunity. Uh, and, and that's when I flipped in my head, so looking back on it, something, something clicked. And I looked beyond... Um, technique and I looked at the business opportunity that was being presented to me um, and that's when um, I started looking at construction and ground engineering in a very different way mm. yeah it's interesting that like because I think people listening to this I think part of the reason why we, we do this show is because I think sometimes you've been with a larger organization and you know, as you said, you've been doing multi-million multi multi pound projects and all of a sudden something like that is presented to you. And, and it's interesting because I think, I think a lot of people actually think the same thing. They think, oh, well, yeah, maybe it could be a step back from where I, 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 I maybe am. Mm -hmm. So, so how did you, how did you kind of compartmentalize, compartmentalize that in your mind? Because I understand like when you first, when you first probably saw it, how, how did that change over time, that, that kind of mindset? And, and how long did it take you to realize, actually, this is a genuine business opportunity, something for me to grow and build myself almost? Good question. So, yeah, it was, it was three months of internal turmoil <laughs> conversation with myself. So I was initially approached uh, in April, April, May, June. Mm -hmm. uh, and then July, I finally made my decision. Um, of that year, July 2014, that was 2014. Mm -hmm. uh, so it took me a long time, uh, and I think I was probably being a little bit immature and naive originally when I didn't when I didn't give it the credit it was due. Um, looking back on it now, um, but I'm glad I made the decision because um, what what I, what I came to in my head was be brave, <laughs> be bold, um, because yeah, you could stay in major projects, you can stay in large diameter. Um, and maybe make a may, maybe make a good career of that, staying at a project level, or be brave and be bold and take the next level up and run a business. 
um, and create a business and uh, almost create a <coughs> a business that you have an opportunity to shape, mould, and create a legacy as well. Um, which, looking back on it, I'm so glad I did. And I'm also very grateful for the MD at the time who who employed me and allowed me the freedom um, to a certain level to do that. But I'm also equally great, grateful to my, my current director, uh, who's based out of Denmark, for continuing that support to let me continue to grow the team and grow the business uh, in the right way. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, it was a three months is not a long time uh, in business, but uh, to, yeah. to make a decision on a career path, uh, it was thoroughly thought through at the end. But initially, it was a very naive, mm. no, I don't want to do that. What was your family's view on it? My family still think I'm a landscape gardener, so uh, they... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you didn't you um, didn't take their counsel there. <laughs> um, but I, don't, my, I spoke with my wife uh, because coupled with this, there was a lifestyle change because we uh, we lived down south. Um, although I'm from the northeast originally, we. We emigrated down south when the recession hit and we moved to a beautiful town called St Albans. It meant that we had to move back up to the Midlands or up to the Midlands, uh, which is where we currently move, uh, live now. So it was not only a career change for me, um, it was a lifestyle change for my, my wife, well, my fiance at the time actually, uh, and me. Um, we went from living in a, in a town close to London with a lot happening to a, a very rural area. Uh, so, we, and we got married that year as well. So we, we had to sell the house, get married, um, and change career. And my wife left her uh, job in London, and uh, yeah, <laughs> not much, not much change, not much change there. <laughs> no, 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 no. So there was a lot going on that year. So it was a, it was a, it was a lot of, a lot of other factors. Um, mm -hmm. But it's worked out well. Um, for for think, both. Do you, think, do you think that you, you you like? Do you think? Because I, I, this resonates with me quite a lot. Because I think um, when I left a larger organisation in, in 2018 to set up, set up my business, um, I moved house that year. I had my little my little boy came three months after I'd um, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd set up the business, and and, and almost I kind of in, in my mind I, I I didn't quite know if it was the right thing to do or what mm -hmm. I was really doing, but I just knew I needed to. I think I was just growing up. I think I needed mm -hmm. to just shift. You know, I just thought, right, I'm shifting, and, and I wasn't just shifting one thing; I was shifting everything. And, mm -hmm. and so I, that, that, I understand how that. I, I, yeah, I can probably understand how you felt a little bit in that period. Well, I had a jet black beard at that time. Um, if you look <laughs> back and, and look at me now, I'm, 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 you know, I'm in practice for for Christmas. But no, I think um, I think it was the right time to make the step it was the right time to make the um the, the change as well from the, the project focus into the business focus um but also just keep coming back to what i said at the very start about maintaining the core principles of that ambition mm -hmm. never being satisfied and keeping keeping a good grounded approach mm -hmm. um has helped and what's also helped in that journey is i've been able to apply uh, the mentality of working in a, in a in a smaller organization at the time although they're not small now um <clears throat> taking that into a larger organization and adopting the same principles has allowed me then to merge the skill set of a large company with a small smaller company which has fallen lovely uh, into a medium sized business medium sized enterprise so i've got the combined ability of the larger company and the smaller company approach as well yeah. so it's worked out quite nicely yeah so you, st so you started so when you joined us left then you were you weren't direct to level initially, were you? Or was that? No. No. No, no I went in as, a, as general manager for the piling um, department. Yeah. Was there always that pathway? So when it was sold to you, was there that pathway to directorship there for you? Yeah. Mm, yeah. 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 So I joined the business as piling manager, actually, not general manager, piling manager. Mm -hmm. But at the time, Arsliff um, and, uh, were, were pretty narrow in their disciplines. Um, and uh, the, what the opportunity was, was to, to grow with the business and um, expand the, the, the services and, and diversify the business um, and, and grow it, grow it ultimately off the back of that, that strategy. Uh, with the 
ultimate goal of losing that high concentration risk that that Arsliff had in the UK, which was single, more or less single technique, single discipline. Um, and if that technique, for some reason, slows down or there, there isn't that much work around for that technique, uh, the company slows down. So a, from a business point of view, high concentration risk. So that was what the opportunity ultimately was, was to grow the, the, the techniques and be a bit more broader, but still remain niche, still remain a specialist at the, um, at the subcontractor level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's interesting and, and, and wise. You know, I think a lot of businesses, it doesn't matter whether you're, you're in ground engineering or, or you're in another business and it doesn't, another sector, you know, uh, yeah, you see a lot of businesses flounder because of high concentration levels in one specific discipline mm. or skill set. So, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's a common thing. So, so obviously moved into director level. Um, so in terms of the kind of the last couple of years, Obviously, various challenges thrown mm. at us. How have you, uh, how have you adapted? Um, yeah, really good question. Again, we've actually just been talking about this, that this morning. I think, uh, recession aside, um, the last three years have been um, particularly interesting, certainly for me personally, but also for, for, for the company. Uh, I'd say three of the most challenging years um, on a business level and on, on, a, on a personal level as well, where we've had to, um, uh, rebuild um, we've had to uh, refocus we've had to uh, strengthen the core team uh, and we've also had to deal with Brexit and uh, lately obviously uh, coronavirus as well um, so yeah it's, it's been a it's, it's been a pretty tough three years but also a very rewarding three years and I'm, and I'm and I'm pretty proud to say now I think the business is in, is in, a, is in a really good place uh, internally um, with the team uh, we're set up to deal with many challenges coming coming at us, uh, and we're prepared to tackle them, them head on. Um, we have a tremendous culture in Arslev, and I'm very proud of it. Yeah, good. Yeah, I, I, I keep seeing you step into the blue hashtag on mm -hmm. LinkedIn. Yeah, is, is there a story behind that? Yes, there is. Um, so go back to conversations and we talked about diversification. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> to do that, we did it organically. We also bought a business. Um, and in doing so, we, uh, we, we brought in different core values, different cultures. And as we recruited, we were bringing in other people's values and cultures and uh, behaviors from different parts of industry. And uh, we wanted to get it all under one umbrella. Um, and we wanted to reflect the core values of the business under one banner one umbrella so when you join Arsenal, if you step into the blue blue is our branded color that means when you're on board with Arsenal, if you step into the blue when you drive a rig you step into the blue you when you go into a client meeting you step into the blue everything that you do is uh, as an Arsenal employee you're stepping into the blue and what does that mean it means you behave in line with the core values of the business the core values are health life trust and responsibility so every decision that you make as you as you operate your daily business in Arslev, you must adopt those core values in your process. Mm -hmm. Have a high performance mentality here, um, and that that's that's our culture here. We 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 work together. We work as a team. We're a high performing team. And that's what stepping into the blue means. We're safe. We're responsible, and we're trustworthy in in our in our execution of our daily business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Really, I I, I love that. I think I think what's resonating from you, Kevin, your you, you, your clarity and your focus, and you you can tell us that energy and your, and your belief in in I think you you come across as as you know exactly what Asla for about what you're mm -hmm. about what you want, and I think that's like really I think bringing bringing it back to the conversation we had a little bit before we jumped on this this um, this this podcast about uh, leadership. And I know that's something that, that, that you are um, very passionate about. You institute, you remember the Institute of Directors. You know, I, I think that that's it's resonating from you that, mm. that, that it's that you are, you know, a strong leader. Um, so do you want to do you want to tell us? Obviously, let's take it back to the last couple of years. Um, we've all had a lot of challenges. Um, you know, outside of 
sector specific challenges. Um, I know personally in my business, we've started to look under the bonnet. Um, and I think, I think if anything in the last six months has taught, has taught me, it's actually to, it's to actually really look under the bonnet of your business about what's actually working and what's not working and why are we doing it? And mm. what are the reasons why we're doing it? And actually, can we do it better? And is it efficient? And does it have purpose? And, mm. and, um, I think I'd like to know for you, from you then. So, you know, in terms of leadership element, how how challenging has that been over the past two years? The easy answer would be to say very challenging, but uh, you know, it's it, it hasn't been very challenging. Um, it's been educational. Um, uh, it's been interesting. It's been rewarding, um, and I've taken great value from the challenge. Um, it's a very, very broad question to answer, though. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I suppose, I suppose, um, I suppose, in terms of, um, I suppose, a better question would probably, you know, what what have you learned about yourself from from, in terms of leadership over the last kind of twelve months? Yeah, listen to others. <laughs> be em- be empathetic. Listen to yeah. others. Yeah. Um, but when the decision needs to be made, make your own decision. Mm. Um, and I've had some tough decisions to to make uh, over the past three years for the for the for the benefit of the business longer term. Mm. Um, listen to yourself definitely listen to yourself because uh it's very easy to get sidetracked by uh, by somebody else but also take on board other people's opinions in that process yeah yeah um but no it's um it's quite a reflective piece this in this podcast isn't it i'm i'm, I'm deep in thought as i yeah. as i as i as as try and answer the question I yeah think, I, I, I mean i mean yeah it's, it's you know i mean in terms of kind of you're obviously kind of passionate about learning about um different techniques in leadership um you know do you want to tell us kind of a little bit about what your you know what what your um what your approach has been in terms of your institute of director um work and kind of how that's how that's kind of panned out and and why and why you went down that route you know obviously something that you're passionate about yeah, I mean, the institute directors is just to give a different perspective from a higher level on on on, on how to apply. Mm. Um, your, your director's title as such, is, mm. so you're covered on the on, on the statutory side. Um, I suppose the, the 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 most recent thing that I'd like to talk about is probably my my my, my accelerated MBA. Yeah. Um, and 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 I met a, I met a great leader uh, leadership coach uh, called Philip Barnes on. Uh, on, on, on the course and he resonated so much with me in, in the three day uh, intense course that I've actually got every other director in Arsliff uh, in the UK <laughs> going through the same course. Um, I wouldn't say I, I particularly learned that much from it um, but what, what it did do is it just made me reflect and that, that through the course of my career um, even, even through playing football and, and, and sports with people as a kid um, Naturally, you you can have leadership qualities. Um, you may not have them, but then suddenly something something will remind you that actually I've done that and I can apply it here. And then over time, you just get more and more familiar with applying something that's not even related to what you're doing. Mm. Um, but it's just having that quality um, that you've picked up over the or that experience that you've picked up over your over your over your life uh, and applying it at that moment in time. For example. Um, Presenting, <laughs> presenting to people. Most people are terrified of presenting, and I used to be terrified of presenting uh, yeah. to people. But now I actually love it. And and <laughs> believe it or not, it was just as simple as thinking. Well, actually, I used to do this as captain of a football team when I was younger. I used to talk to the players on the team. So why can't I do it now in a, in, a, in a room? And then you just get a bit of confidence, and then blah, 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 over time, you're presenting to 250 people in a room. Yeah. And it's it's almost like you're having a conversation with that room. Yeah. You know, just little bits, sound bites, and uh, experiences that you can apply yeah. um, over time, and then suddenly it clicks and makes sense. Mm-hmm. Do Do you feel? I, I know something that, that's important to me. You talked about kind of there. You'd, you'd you'd been learning off various different people. Uh, have you had a lot of strong mentors in your life? 
professionally? Because uh, that's something that that's something that I think has really helped me over the last couple of years as a as a business owner. Yeah, I mean, originally, definitely the two guys I mentioned at the start. Um, mm. One, 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 one more than the other. One more in the background, uh, which I didn't have that much contact with, but one more face to face. Trevor, Trevor Colin, um, for sure. Um, I'm going to say a mixture, Pete, because I actually learned a lot more from people who didn't meet my expectations of a leader, right. uh, and and I've, yeah. I took that on board on on how not to do, to do something. Yeah. Um, I think that's probably how. I've, I've kind of reversed engineered a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've always had, uh, I've got some very bizarre principles myself. I, I, I always, I've always found it a struggle to, uh, to work for someone who's, um, I, I'm going to be bold and say it. I've always found it a struggle to work for somebody that's stupider than me. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I've, that's one of my big things. <laughs> you might want to cut that point, but it's a principle of mine. Um, oh, we'll leave it in. No holds barred. Uh, I'm not going to mention any names because I don't think it's fair. Um, but yes, uh, uh, that's one of my principles. Um, and, I, and I suppose I've applied that quite a lot during my career and it's what's kind of defined some of the decisions I've made mm. as well. Mm. Yeah. It's probably a completely abstract way of doing things, but um, it, it works for me. No, no. That's quite interesting. Do you think, I mean, so, so you know, do you think, because I think certainly over the last kind of, what's happened this year, strong leadership has been absolutely key. Um, mm. And um, and there was a lot, you know. I think for me personally, I think it, it, there was a lot of kind of there was a lot of panic out there come come in April, and I I understand. Listen, I, I get it. You know, all of a sudden you've got business potentially falling off a cliff. Mm. Organisations are looking at their, their fixed cost base and thinking, Jesus Christ, mm. what what you know what we're going to do? But mm. um, I think those who were who were strong and actually really thought right you know stay clear to our vision stay clear to our values as you said you know your, your, your principles i think those are the businesses that are, that'll, that'll will, will thrive off the back of this really so um mm. did you did you find did you find it challenging to kind of at times just to kind of keep that strength because i know that I, I found that quite difficult at times um I think the build-up to um, to national lockdown uh, was difficult to comprehend, mm. um, and I think uh, that 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 was that was tough mentally because it, it, it wasn't it wasn't clear what was going to happen. Um, but when when the lockdown was announced, uh, it was actually quite easy to make the right decision because control was taken away mm. um, and I always said the easiest thing to do was to stop Yeah. but the hardest thing to do would be to get back to work because no one knew what getting back to work would look like yes so the build up was, was very tense, the decision was actually very easy but at the same time, it was, a, it was a very tense time to make the decision. Mm. But we had to do, and I had to do the right thing to protect everybody. But what that, do is that, what that did is it actually bought us a little bit of time and it gave us that opportunity to take stock, open the curtains the, the, the following morning and see what does the world look like, reevaluate, risk assess our operations, and then start again in the right way and adopt the new way of working. Um, and in, in fact, that actually worked very quickly and very well for us. We didn't necessarily go into survival modes because um, we'd already had the, uh, the technology in place to continue. Uh, although I, say, I, think, I think we did actually. We, we went into survival mode a little bit, but we, we actually came out of it very quickly. Mm. Um, and and what, I, what I must say is the strength and depth of the team here in Arsliff and Centrum mm. pile. Um, was um, was admirable. Uh, the guys adopted to it quickly. Uh, the workforce adopted to it quickly. The staff adopted to it quickly, and everybody knew what they were meant to do. Mm. Um, so yeah, in in summary, it was it was a bit of a tense build up, a confused build up. 
tense decision, but also an easy decision because control was taken away. Yeah. A very structured, planned return to work, uh, and, it, and it worked well for the company. And I think now, um, on reflection, um, we were right in that approach. Um, I, I don't think we did much wrong at that time. Yeah. Um, and now, the good thing is, now we've done that, we've gone through the process, we're actually in the traps looking to get back and out working quicker than than most others as well um yeah which is a positive yeah and i think i think that i think all the businesses as well uh, you know the the, the appeared to me there was that period of you know a couple of weeks of actually sit, assessing listen how do we actually make this work mm. because no one had ever seen anything like this before and it was like actually we're gonna have to we're gonna have to find a way yes and 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 that was a challenging period but i think um construction industry industry in general just you know found found a way and and that's that's something that i think the industry in general is very you know is very good at certainly yeah there was a lot of noise if you remember in the press about stop construction stop this and stop that and the emotions were quite high and yeah. and you know people were very very scared very uncertain um but it it was a time for reflection, a time, a time to take stock, and a time to reevaluate what we were doing. And I think, I think the team, the team did it very well here. Yeah, yeah. So just moving forward, then um, next twelve months for for Arslev, for yourself personally, what what does that what does that look like? I appreciate it's a lot of businesses are struggling to see three to six months ahead let alone 12 months but yeah do you want to give us a, an overview of kind of how that looks for for the business yeah so so we we, we aren't stopping uh we our momentum's continuing um you know you talked about clarity you know our vision is, is pretty clear actually we we know where we, we, we we're, we're heading towards um and you know I dare i say it, i'm going to be a little bit optimistic you know uh construction and people in general uh, aren't that optimistic i'm going to book the trend and I'm, I'm going to say i am um we can see good good pipeline. We can see uh, our good core market um, being being fairly buoyant right now. Um, so yeah, we we can see a pretty busy period. Um, certainly for the next twelve months. Um, for the first time in in my OSF career, we have a pipeline which takes us to the back end of twenty twenty one. A visible work, not secured work, a visible work, which is always a good sign. Um, we're going to move um, some of our plant around. We're going to take on um, hopefully another plant uh, department uh, and expand expand that a little bit, uh, increase some supply, capability of our precast piles. We're going to grow into um, uh, the mini piling market and the rotary board piling market as well, mm -hmm. organically, um, in a structured way, in a safe way, in a, in a sensible way. Um, so yeah, we, we, we have a plan. We have a three-year plan. Um, and at the moment, we're on, we're on track for that. Good, good. And and just just to just to um, kind of finish off, Kevin. So I wanted to ask you this, really. So for for you know, for a young person um, coming into the, I suppose young engineers, really. Um, what what? Why would they choose a, a career in? ground engineering what what do you think the, the value is of, of of someone coming into that i mean i appreciate your i appreciate your your uh, career from building uh, <laughs> building fences at the very start it was a <laughs> was a kind of a, a, a slightly different route but you know um i think that, you know engineering is is, is engineering skill short is across the uk at the minute so you know what what are the what are the key values of a of a, of a young person kind of coming into that market at the minute would you say it's a very rewarding uh career actually in ground engineering because people don't give ground engineering professionals the credit that they are due uh everyone likes and we call it sexy building everyone likes sexy building when you get out the ground yeah um <clears throat> because you can see it it's tangible but actually some of the some of the building that we do underground the subterranean construction is actually a lot more complicated and a lot more uh, challenging and equally rewarding when you uh, when you deliver it um, and there's some great you, know, you get to see some great things some, meet some great people um, you know you one day you can be looking at a mine shaft uh, collapsing in the Newcastle or Gateshead wherever uh, then the next day you're putting in 10,000 piles on a, on an absolutely enormous logistics shed 
uh, down south somewhere next to a harbour or a port. It's so diverse. Yeah. Um, you, you, you get, you know, if you, if you enter in at the right level, um, uh, you'll get a good round business um, appreciation early on as well. Um, and I'm not just talking about Arsliff here, I'm talking about others as well. Um, you'll not be pigeonholed. Um, and also, there's always going to be a requirement for ground engineering. You know, yeah. every building starts from the ground. So, you know, nine times out of ten, there will be some some sort of treatment, investigation, or whatever before anything gets built. So, you know, it's it's a sustainable career uh, if you can handle the fact that you'll never see what you build, more more, <laughs> more or less. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I can imagine you driving along saying, "Yeah, actually, yeah, underground there. That's what that's what." That, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. There's, there's something under there, but it's you're never going to see it. it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but no, it's um, you know, it's it's a tough sell actually um, at times. But I think you do a what, good job. What? Well, what? What I did a few years ago. Um, we we, we in terms of skills shortage, we 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 recognise that where our industry is short of uh, s skills. How do we attract um, younger generations into into this? environment this industry and what we did in Arsliff and what I led in Arsliff was the creation of a virtual reality world we call it the Arsliff world where uh, you're taking gaming technology into construction so when we go to career fairs we've got a pre-loaded virtual reality headset and it's an immersive experience where uh, an engineer an undergraduate can actually get into a construction site in a virtual space and see what we do uh, and that's actually Amazing. Yeah, that's, that's actually working now, but it's not working now because we can't do it. Um, but yeah, we designed it. A good friend of mine, uh, Ben Bennett, um, designed and built this virtual world uh, for us uh, with his company, Luminous Group, up in Newcastle. Uh, and it's a tremendous tool. Um, it just, we can't use it because of coronavirus right now. But when when we get through this, we'll be we'll be applying that. That's very innovative. Mm. Yeah. Real good way to get people interested. Mm. Yeah, yeah, link the two, gaming technology and, and real world, and uh, yeah, we can see a potential yeah. good, uh, good gateway there. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the Slaley Hall experience as well, because I didn't tell you at the time. Yeah, go on, tell when, me. When I, when I made my career choice by applying for the job, um, there's a coincidence, actually, because my future wife's dad built Slaley Hall, so I didn't realise that at the time when I made that decision. I made two decisions. Uh, I was on the spot where my future wife dad had left a legacy um, <clears throat> and I also started my own career which hopefully will leave a legacy in the future there you go yeah mm. yeah very good yeah interesting no well listen Kevin I really appreciate you coming on um, thank you very much for, for, for being on the show are, are you I mean are you comfortable with if I, if we kind of tag you on LinkedIn and we put all this together oh, definitely. Are, yeah, are, you, yeah, yeah. are you comfortable for people to reach out to you and totally <laughs> Yeah, 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 totally, totally fine. Uh, we'll, we'll, you know, I say we're we're quite active on social media ourselves, anyway. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, my 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 team are, are all over it. Which we, we try and promote as much as we can on social media, actually. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely no problem at all. Yeah, yeah, it's a great platform to be honest. Now, I think businesses. We were talking about this yesterday in a meeting. Actually, I think businesses who aren't active on, uh, particularly on 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 LinkedIn, are, are kind mm. of missing a trick really in terms of um, mm. company brand and candidate attraction and, and various mm. different bits and pieces. So, yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, Kevin, that's great. Um, so for everyone listening, um, I'll be back next week with uh, another show. And in the meantime, um, yeah, if you uh, if you want to tune in and listen, obviously this uh, this will be active on uh, YouTube and um, Apple um, on the podcast available from next week. So yeah, thanks for listening and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks. <laughs>